thank you for having me and uh, great turnout. I'm good of all of you to take time to come out and uh, learn what we think is an important topic going forward. So I have some disclosures. They are there. They should not be uh, particularly relevant to alignment uh, talk. So, so spinal deformity, right, we're seeing it more and more. The fact that all of you are here for this is, is a testament to how important it's becoming. And as neurosurgeons, we're doing it more and more. Scoliosis, kyphosis, and sagittal imbalance that you're hearing a lot about today. And there's a lot of overlap on some of these talks. And I'm going to try and talk about a few things that haven't been discussed uh, as much and in sort of the global alignment perspective and try and put it in a big picture. But uh, you will get some repetition. But in certain things like the sacral pelvic parameters, that's a good thing because it's a really important part of what we, what we do. And I know Justin will cover that in depth next. So, so the key in a, when you have an adult deformity, you have to recognize the deformity, try and figure out, is this their problem? How, what role does this play? And then factor that into any of your treatment plans. And I always think about identifying that deformity. Is there a scoliosis? It's kind of easy to pick up. Is there a listhesis? That factors into how you're going to correct it. Is it affecting a sagittal plane issue? Is it a lateral listhesis? Uh, is there kyphosis? Where? And is it normal? Is it abnormal? The overall balance, coronal balance, obviously, is important, but sagittal balance is really what, what uh, we're talking about a lot, and that's what the focus of my talk is going to be a lot of today. What's their SVA? What are their pelvic parameters? And then one thing that you miss a lot is, is there a concavity stenosis? You have people coming in with radicular pain that get an MRI or a myelogram, and it doesn't look so bad, but they have radiculopathy when they stand and walk around. It's because when they lay down, the deformity corrects partially, and when they stand up, it it, gravity you know, sinks them in, that frame and closes down and they get radicular pain, so you need to think about that when you're trying to identify symptom drivers. Uh, so I always talk about steps to correct a deformity, and today we're just gonna be talking about the assessment of balance part of this. So key concepts for me, sagittal balance and spinal alignment is the single most important factor when we're talking about patients with deformity. It has the greatest impact on function in the term the conus of economy, as a John Dubesay uh, term that people use quite a bit because it really is an elegant way of thinking of how people function and stand up. Coronal balance is important, but being a little off in the coronal plane isn't that big a deal. Being off in the sagittal plane is a big deal. Uh, and coronal balance is actually a little bit tricky uh, to judge in surgery. Sagittal is a little easier to tell whether you got it or not. Coronal is a little hard sometimes. Uh, this is a video, it's from Chris Ames at UCSF who put these together, so I have a few of these. And this is showing that conus of economy. Essentially, you see a patient standing up, and if they stand in what we think is this conus of economy, if they're standing up with their head balanced over their shoulders, balanced over their pelvis, balanced over their feet, they can stand up, and you can stand up all day. You're not using a lot of energy. Your, your motion is, right, you have economy. You're not having to do any real work to stand up. If a patient starts to lean forward and is out of balance here, as soon as you lean forward and your gravity line gets in front of your feet, you have to do something to keep from falling over. And usually that's your lumbar extensor muscles start to work. People get low back pain just from the fatigue of that. And if you want to try it someday, when you're in your hotel room later by yourself, try leaning forward for five minutes. It's miserable. It really gets painful. So people get back pain and as it gets worse, they start to get, do other compensatory measures. So when we talk about spinal balance again, I'm not going to belabor this, so maybe we'll catch us up on time a little bit. C7 plumb line is sort of the, where it all started. It's mid-body C7, the posterior superior aspect of the sacrum. 36-inch x-ray is mandatory to measure that. T1 tilt is an angular measurement. It takes into factor a little bit more positional factors, and it's probably a, a, a better measure if you think about it, but it's a little bit harder to use sometimes. It, but it's gaining steam, I think, but I'm not going to cover too much of that today. And again, a C7 plumb line that's in front of your sacrum is, is a positive sagittal balance. If it's behind, that's negative. Positive is the big problem. Negative usually isn't, but we talked about cervical a little bit. I'll show you a little bit in the global balance where, where that factor is in. And if you have global balance here, we're talking about the sacral pelvic parameters. Getting that balanced and getting the spine uh, aligned is really the key. Here's an old slide, one of Steve Onder's old patients that has just some nice pictures with it, a patient that was significantly malaligned. You see him trying to lean over. You can see why he'd be working his posterior extensor muscles trying to stand up and then postoperatively standing up uh, quite nicely, back to balance, not having to do any real work to stand up. That's why people can, can do that without back pain, without fatigue. Being imbalanced is a fatiguing process. It is energy inefficient. You are using energy and calories uh, to stand up when you do that. So getting back to balance helps people in a lot of uh, ways. So spinal balance, we see people, we see, if you walk down the street, you see lots of deformities if you're looking for them. 
but not everybody is leaned way over. People are doing all kinds of crazy things to stand up because they're trying to be balanced. People can't stand with that lean forward posture using just their spinal extensor muscles for very long. So you alter your other curves. If you're bent forward at your lumbar spine, you hyperextend your thoracic spine, you reduce your thoracic kyphosis. It's the concept that you'll hear some people refer to as reciprocal change after an operation. Somebody that's hyperextending their thoracic spine and they have less thoracic kyphosis than they're supposed to have or they should normally have because they're compensating for a lumbar deformity and you fix their lumbar deformity, then they get, then they relax, they get back their natural thoracic kyphosis and then you look like you didn't get enough correction. Uh, so that has to factor in. So you can alter your other curves that are still flexible. Uh, you can change your sacral inclination, your pelvic tilt, and that's the most common things people do. You see people, they sort of tuck their butt in, they lean back on their, you know, uh, Hip flexors, they sort of stretch those out and lean back on those and try and rest there. That uses some of the leg muscles. You start to bend your knees. There's all kinds of things people do trying to compensate for this. And looking at them globally, not just looking at their lumbar spine or the thoracic spine or even just their C7 to S1, you miss the, the big picture of global alignment. And the sacrum, it's really easy to pick out on an x-ray. You can, right, if you're looking for pelvic tilt, you can measure everything else, but just look at the sacrum. If it's really horizontal versus really vertical, you, you can tell a lot of compensation, right? If you can, like as soon as the x-ray goes up, you can tell whether somebody's, uh, it's a compensated posture or not. It's pretty easy to, uh, to tell. So here are two patients that are both compensating and they're compensating for different things. So look at the global alignment of these two people. This lady has a negative plumb line but she's still extending her hips. She's still compensating. She's driving her plumb line back for some reason. Why is she doing that if her C7 plumb line is negative? This gentleman has a thoracic kyphosis but a lumbar flat back deformity. He's compensating, you can see his hips, you can't really see him real well, but he's thrusting his pelvis forward uh, to compensate for this, trying to bring his plumb line back. They're two very different deformities, both doing the same thing and you sort of start to think, why, why is that? And this is a research project that Steve Andre and I were sitting around and, and looking at that very slide showing things a decade ago probably, uh, talking about that and trying to figure out what, what is the difference here. And this, is, this began, became a research project. We applied to Medtronic for a grant. That's why they're on my slide of just having to disclose this. And so they funded this, this project, and, uh, which doesn't have anything to do with implants. It's just looking at normal balance. But we said, what's the difference here between these patients? And, and a lot of the alignment work was originally done by orthopedic surgeons, right? They look at a C7 plumb line, and as a neurosurgeon, it's sort of offensive that you're not thinking about the head. And I always use the phrase, I live up in my head. I don't live in my C7. So when I'm trying to balance myself out, I'm trying to balance my head over my, my pelvis, not my C7 over my pelvis. And so we started thinking about that. So we started thinking about things. And C7 plumb line is good, but it doesn't really tell the whole thing. So the true balance is trying to keep your head up over your sacrum and pelvis and use that so you're in that conus of economy. So what we did, we took 100 asymptomatic volunteers, so patients that did not have any prior back issues, no back pain, no surgeries, uh, no real issues in the 20 to 40, and then we took 100 in the 60 to 80 year old age group. We did a simple standing lateral radiograph and we looked at a, at a few things. We looked at their C7 plumb line, we looked at their C2 plumb line, and then we looked at their cranial center of mass. And there was a nice study done uh, back in the 80s uh, looking at trying to calculate how is it best to estimate the center of mass of the head. And they did some, some testing and they found if you drew a line from the nasion to the inion, the midpoint of that line really best approximated where the center of mass of the head really is. That's not very hard to measure on an x-ray as long as you get the bottom half of the skull on there. So we measured that on all of these patients. And we came up with some normative values. So cranial center of mass, if you look at a 20 to 4 year old, is nine millimeters in front of the posterior superior aspect of the sacrum. Uh, C2 was negative uh, 2.7. Uh, in the 60 to 80, that's a little bit forward. So we're uh, C7, uh, 11 millimeters or, uh, can be in front, four centimeters in the front here. Uh, and we did some correlation coefficients and they really matched really well because they were sort of normal individuals and they didn't have a cervical issue so things matched up and they should match up. And so we came up with these values and we thought, well, you know, that's important. But it, the, the people asked us, well, the correlation coefficient is so high, why don't you just use C7? And it, right, that's true. So we do use C7 a lot of the time because they match up really well. We don't use C2 when we could, it's a little better than C7, but C7 is really easy on an x-ray. But when you look at that patient there and you look at the, the ones that were compensating, I'll show you the, the differences here. 
and why that really matters. So again, here's how we would measure it. Global balance, you can see the Nasion Inion line, I hope, up there. Pretty easy to draw. You drop a point from the midpoint there and a point from C7 there. That's what a normal looks like. C7 is falling right over that posterior superior aspect of the sacrum in a fairly normal looking individual versus here just in front of it. That's normal. That's what a normal individual should look like. So we take this person here, 68 year old female came in with low back pain, radiculopathy, and an MRI that isn't all that impressive. She's got not a lot of stenosis. Her frame looked pretty open. Again, an MRI is a supine exam for the most part. And you get a standing x-ray on her, just a lumbar x-ray, and look at the change in lordosis. She is hyperlordotic in her lumbar spine compared to her, her, uh, her MRI. And if you get a standing x-ray, her C7 plumb line's way negative. She's got a scream in her dick when she's standing up. And if you measure her C7 plumb line, it's way negative, but if you measure her cranial center mass, it's perfectly normal. So she is compensating for her head, not for C7, because she has a cervical kyphosis. So cervical thoracic kyphosis, her cranial center mass and her C7 aren't in alignment. So she's compensating, but compensating for her cranial center mass, not for her C7. And that drives her plumb line negative. She hyperlordoses her lumbar spine and gets radiculopathy because she's closing down her foramen, but that's just trying to stand up. So this is an old Andre patient, did a fairly crazy thing, operated on somebody's neck for a lumbar radic, and, uh, and it got better. But if you look at after the operation, you correct that deformity, those two parameters come back to normal. She doesn't need to hyperlordose her lumbar spine anymore, and her symptoms go away. Here's a patient of mine, is a 62-year-old female, had a drop head syndrome, which is just a failure of the posterior musculature, an inability to hold her head up. The reason she got it I, is kind of crazy, and I won't go into that, but she's got this She's got a thoracic kyphosis too, but she's got a cervical kyphosis. That's iatrogenic actually, after being in a collar for too long. Uh, and if you look at her, I corrected her cervical kyphosis. Now she had neck pain and low back pain that were equal to each other. And if you look at her C7 plumb line, again, she falls way negative. If you look at her cranial center of mass, it's perfect. It falls right over the posterior super aspect of the sacrum. So she is balancing her head, not her C7. And afterwards, you look at those two parameters come right back to normal and her low back pain goes away. So she's not hyperextending, she's not overloading her facets. And all of this comes from just looking at, at patients. You know, we sit in there and you don't understand something, you sort of throw it up and everybody looks at it and you talk and that's how the study came about. But it was a relatively easy research study. I did it while I was finishing uh, training and extended into when I finally got published recently, but uh, it takes a while. But it's a, it's a project that I initiated in training. It wasn't very difficult. We got a little funding, did it. And uh, it's something that you have a question, you study it fairly simply, you answer it and, it, and it works out fairly well. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about pelvic uh, incidents, but the more you see pelvic tilt, pelvic uh, incidents, sacral slope, the better they are. Uh, it is gonna be a factor, and the reason for that is you rotate around those femoral heads so much, there's so much variability in how you can change your posture from your, from your uh, femoral heads, it's, it's uh, impressive, and if you don't measure it, you will be missing the biggest part of the picture. And you're trying to pick this patient out from this patient. And a lot of people see patients, they see their x-rays, they examine them sitting down or on the examination table. You have to get patients to stand up, that's step one, and then get them to walk. People can compensate and fake it when they stand for a few minutes. If you walk, they can't hold it anymore. They lean forward, you see all of these compensatory mechanisms come out, and you see what their real deformity is. Here's another uh, video showing a patient that is imbalanced, has a lumbar flat back deformity, becoming out of that conus of economy and you can see how they retrovert on there and I'm right gets them back into balance that's what they do they tuck that butt in they right, have a really flat looking butt uh, that costs energy they have to do something to do that but that helps them compensate somebody that's even more imbalanced tries to compensate so they start by retroverting their pelvis they can't get all the way there then they bend their knees so you can see the low back and neck strain indicated there. They can't go back any further on their pelvis because their femoral heads won't go back anymore in their acetabulum. So they bend their knees, now they're, now they're getting leg pain because their legs are fatiguing. And the whole concept of patients that do well with the shopping cart, so we always learn shopping cart is, oh, that's a lumbar stenosis sign. But that's also a sagittal imbalance sign. Somebody that can't stand up and stands up, gets a shopping cart or a walker, the reason that that works is, the problem is their gravity line is in front of their feet and they're trying to balance out between the two points that are their feet. If you give them another point out in front, whether it's a cane or a walker, now you balance between three or four points and you 
take some of that work away. And that's why patients do really well with that, but they're not real functional. So if you can get them back to balanced and standing upright, you can get rid of a lot of those assistive devices. Or alternatively, if you get some disaster of a patient that is a medical train wreck and you don't think can get through an operation, getting them one of those little wheelie walkers will do a lot for their functionality and, uh, and keep them away for sur from surgery. So when we talk about correction, I'm just going to go through a patient on how I correct things. It's very much like you just saw from, from Praveen. I look at this patient. This is an anesthesiologist, old Harrington rod construct, flat back deformity, fairly classic thing you'll see quite a bit. If I measure things, I measure a C7 plumb line. It's obviously way in front. I measure her pelvic incidence, 58 degrees, fairly normal. I measure her pelvic tilt, 35 degrees, grossly abnormal. We want it, normal is about 12 to 15. We want it to be less than 20. And I measure where I want her spine to be. And if I'm going to cut a PSO, I'm calculating that. What do I need? What's that angle? That's what theta is there. And that would be 35 degrees to correct her. So if I think I need 35 degrees to get her back from here to here, okay? And if I need to correct my pelvic tilt from 35 down to 20, that's 50 degrees of total correction. And I double check myself. I say she's got zero degrees of lumbar lordosis right now. If I give her 50 degrees of correction, am I going to be within the 10 degrees or 9 degrees of her pelvic incidence, which is 58, which yes, I am. And if I can just execute that now, I can get her back there. I can't cut a 50 degree PSO in this, in this patient. So I do a, an A lift at L5S1 where she still moves. I get 20 degrees from a simple A lift where she's really flatted out. I put a hyperlordotic cage in there and I get her back pretty well balanced. And then I do a PSO. So here's after an A lift. I do that one morning, get her up. Three days later, I bring her back and do a PSO and we get her back to nicely aligned. And you can see her post-operative CT, that PSO showing there. I don't have inner bodies at some of those levels, which is a risk for rod fracture. But if you look at her fusion mass, that's, you can see her staple still here. So it's an immediate post-operative CT. She is bone on bone through a very large portion of bone and, and uh, the chance of healing that is really good. So I'm not gonna do a big literature review today, but this is what I call the vicious cycle of failure. Sagittal imbalance, there's plenty of literature that would lead you to think that that leads to poor outcomes. It also leads to pseudoarthrosis and it also leads to increased adjacent segment failure. That's a feedback mechanism on a sagittal imbalance. If you have adjacent segment disease, proximal junctional kyphosis, you get even more imbalanced. That leads to poor outcomes. So you wanna keep your patients out of this cycle leading to poor outcomes and it starts with getting them sagittally aligned. As we've evolved to a standing posture, you can see that in this, I show the slide of the evolution of thought, but evolution of the pelvis has really changed significantly. And the evolution of what we're doing in terms of evaluating is this EO system is coming out. We're seeing more and more deformity centers are getting them. We're getting ours in the fall. It looks at the true global alignment. It gets a full body x-ray from the head all the way to the feet. And it does it simultaneous AP and lateral with one sixth the radiation of an x-ray. So it's a really cool new technology. Uh, you can do 3D reconstructions from it. So we're excited to get one. It's like a, this crazy phone booth. They go in and get this uh, x-ray done. But, but really, that's where the future is, and really seeing how these people are aligned. You can see what their knees are doing. Are they bending in their knees? What's their pelvis doing? It's quite cool. So just one case. Uh, here's a, it's just an example of totally missing the forest for the trees. 58-year-old female with multiple falls treated for cervical stenosis. They thought she had myelopathy. She kept falling on her face. So she had cervical stenosis. Her posterior ligaments looked like they were buckling in a little bit, causing cord compression. And a really well-known spine surgeon took her for a cervical laminoplasty. Saw her in the office, sitting there, examined her. Yeah, a little hyperflexic, laminoplasty, did the surgery. I don't know how they even did the operation. It must have been crazy getting her positioned. But they do this operation. She doesn't really get any better. She's still falling on her face. They send her to see one of my partners. He comes and grabs me. And usually one of my partners comes and says, oh, I need you to come see this person. It's usually not good news. Uh, so I stand her up, and that's what her, her standing x-ray looks like. And if you Photoshop her two x-rays together, this is what she looks like. Now, who here thinks she was falling on her face because she had cervical myelopathy? Anybody, right? I, of course not. So she had a huge problem, and this is her best effort at standing. I, I stood her up there, her head would droop. One of her biggest complaints is she was a smoker and she kept burning her stomach with her cigarettes when she'd try and take them out of her mouth. You know, people really, really like smoking. So, uh, so I, I did this to her over a few surgeries, which also is not normal, but uh, she doesn't burn herself with her cigarettes. Uh, which I actually made her quit and she, she stayed off. But, uh, so that's not normal either. And that's a huge, huge operation. But it's back to a normal upright alignment so she can stand up and walk and do all sorts of things that uh, she couldn't do before. So, so inclusion, 
Sagittal balance is key. C7 plumb line isn't enough though. You gotta look at the pelvis. You gotta look at the head. As neurosurgeons, we definitely should be looking at the head and thinking through that. Know your pelvic parameters though, and think big picture on all of these patients. If you have a grade one spondy, the question earlier, should you get a full length film? Absolutely. Stand them up, walk them, get a full length x-ray, know what you're doing. If you're, right, you can get lucky and do a decent job. And even if you're not doing a big deformity correction, knowing what the balance is, knowing what you have to do to try and set them up for future success is, is really important. So thank you. <laughs>